Um, super happy to be back. Um, like he said, my name is Kenny, and uh, this is my second time speaking at InfoBeep, so happy to see you all again. Um, today, uh, we're going to be talking about design and development and how we bridge the gap. Uh, at the moment, I work at a company called Plas Plasmic. It's not working. Yeah, you said it. Uh, I work at a company called Plasmic uh, as the di director of developer experience, and I have a YouTube channel where, well, I do the YouTube stuff, you know, join my channel and all those fun things. Um, I think um, at the end of the day today, what I want you to really go home with is how we as developers, as engineers, as dev teams can help unblock non-developers who are also depending on us to get things done for them in our various companies. And that's uh, what I want to talk about today. I think I'm just going to stick with this. All right, uh, before we kick off, I have some ground rules. Uh, because I spoke with the InfoBeep team, and they did tell me that I do have the right to make all the rooms, all the rules here, because you're in my talk, so uh, I'm the one with the highest authority. The first uh, rule that I have today is like, if I happen to make a boring joke, you know, something that you don't find funny, for whatever reason, this is the reaction I expect from you. <laughs> you have to laugh out so loud that I get to hear it. Uh, otherwise, I'll send you out of my stage. <laughs> and then, uh, the second rule, it's a, a very important one. If I say something completely unrelated, like you don't have an idea what I'm talking about, I expect this kind of reaction. You know, like, yeah, that's it, I get it. Uh, even though you don't, that's fine, but you have to know it. Okay, uh, the last one. If I say something confusing, like, you can relate. I don't understand what this boy is talking about. I do expect this kind of reaction. You no, know, like, yes, go, Kenny, I get it. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> All right. That's really cool. Okay, I said the last one before, but if I talk absolute garbage, something that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, like, you have no idea what I'm talking about. This time, I need you to even be more enthusiastic, like, thank you, that's it. Uh huh. All right, so with that said, if I say something you don't understand, what kind of reaction would you give me then? Yes, it is this one. Do you understand? Awesome. All right, let's kick it off, uh, everyone. Uh, when you talk about bridging the gap between design and development, this is the kind of mental picture that comes to your mind, right? You figure there's developers on one side, and then there's designers on one side, and we're trying to find a way to bridge that gap, right? Um, I want you to do away with that mental picture, keep it somewhere away, and think about something like this. Uh, where we have designers and developers on the same side, and then we have the rest of the company on a different side, and we're trying to find a way to bridge the gap between designers and developers working together on one end of the bargain, and then the rest of the company working on the other side. And um, let's, uh, before I dive far, far deep into that, I want to see how, how we do things at the moment. Um, if you're trying to come up with a new tool or a new product or implement a new feature, there's usually the process of brainstorming, you know, iterating on different ideas, uh, having your stand-ups and talking about how should we do this. And then eventually, you come up with a good idea, and then what happens? You start to design and prototype on those ideas, and eventually it gets handed off to the dev team to build it out, right? Cool, so far so good. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, and then the developers have to build that to pixel perfection. So everything that uh, you've talked about during the design process, uh, during the iteration process, ideation, it gets built out by developers. And then we have the awful task of maintaining that thing forever, right? But that's not even where it ends. It's the exhaustion that comes with building a product once and having the rest of your life to maintain it. Um, what then happens if your marketing team or any other any, a, a different teams from your company comes back to you on that same product for some kind of support, for some kind of constant maintenance? We'll dive into how that looks like, um, but 
it doesn't quite end there. The company is constantly uh, launching campaigns and asking you to do uh, and asking you to do things that weren't in the initial scope of the project because now, for whatever reason, it has succeeded and some other things need to happen afterwards. This is really not working for me. Okay, and then um, say for instance, this is just me speaking uh, generally based on my own experience. Say for instance, your marketing team they want to launch a seasonal sale. For instance, it's uh, it's Christmas and we need to uh, do a Christmas sale, give a discount or something like that. Uh, what if I give up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, what if uh, there's a new product coming out and uh, the marketing team, of course, wants to get uh, a new product page out there to talk about the product and the features and the things that it does. Uh, eventually, that comes back to the dev team as well, right? Because you get to code that out and, and launch it. Um, what if you want to announce an affiliate program and a host of other things that could come up that were not initially in the scope of that project? So you have the dev team and the design team who have done their work, gotten the product out of the way, and then you have all these subsequent requests coming in that you didn't solicit for, but out of need and because you have to constantly support, uh, because everyone is working to move the company forward, right? If you're constantly doing that, what happens is, um, you need to constantly iterate on those things. So the, the picture that I'm trying to paint here is what happens when you're in a company and you're a dev or you're a designer and you've built a product that supposedly you've handed off and it's not supposed to be your concern anymore, but you're working in a company, not just like developers and designers, we don't work in silos. You work uh, based on the requests that come in from the product team, from the design team, from the marketing team, from the growth team. So as these requests keep coming in, you keep having to iterate on them. So for instance, you've built this new landing page for the product that you're announcing. And the next week, uh, the, the, the marketing team wants to add a new CTA, or just they want to change the messaging, and they want to de-emphasize the CTA again for whatever reason, and a host lot of other things like A-B testing, the variance, and personalization. So what do you do then uh, as the developer? It gets frustrating, right, if, if you have to come back again and again to the things that you've already done or the things that you thought you've already done, but because you have to account for the company's needs, you have to constantly iterate and add new features and new iterations as they come up. So uh, in conclusion there, developers and designers are never really done with any project, right? Unless maybe it's you're working for a client and it's just a one-time thing and you've done it and you've given it to them, so whatever happens is none of your business. But if you're working in a company, you're never really done, right? Because you keep on iterating as things come up. Um, by the way, have you seen engineering Jira boards? <laughs> like, like if you are, uh, like I'm talking about this and, you know, imagining yourself in your company doing your work um, and then these requests keep coming in from different teams needing your attention for different things. Um, yeah, let me, let me show you what mine looks like. Something like this. And then each of those boards has a lot more tasks in them, right? We've all seen this. And then it looks like this. And then it looks enormous. So how are you as an engineer attending to all these tickets? And then somebody from the marketing team will come up to you in the morning when you're trying to get one of these things done and say, hey, I need a new landing page. I don't like that, you don't like that. So dev teams um, constantly struggle to combine building the core business goals and then attending to requests that are coming from different parts of the company. Because the end, at the end of the day, we do need to support. <laughs> at the end of the day, we do need to support uh, the entire organization to move the company forward. So you can't just say, hey, this is not uh, on the product roadmap, so I'm not going to attend to that. Um, so what do we do then? To everyone who cares to listen, um, the message that I'm trying to pass today is let's empower non-developers so they can manage their own processes and then remove the entire dependence on the dev team.
right? If, if we can make it possible for, for the marketing team to be able to roll out their own landing pages or to add a CTA when they need it or to do any of those things that keep coming back to the dev team for, then we can really focus the engineering efforts on building the product itself and then having the, 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 the non-developers do whatever they want to do. So how do we set them up? Um, to own their own processes, to own their tasks, to do the things they want to do without any kind of oversight from the engineering team. And that's what I want to talk about today. So let's, th uh, let's think about headless CMSs. I think this is where they really come in, right? They give you the opportunity for non-developers to, you know, architect the, the content, compose it, put it on screen, and, and ship landing pages, for instance. So we celebrated, land uh, we celebrated headless CMSs for this uh, because I think it was like a really good stride Moving, moving us forward as a community, getting to the point where we're not depending so much on developers. And we were all happy, right? Uh, but how do headless CMSs do this, right? Let's look at that for a minute. So first, developers have to define the schemas for the landing page that's going to get built. Uh, if you're going to put a, a button on the page, for instance, you have to define a schema for that. If you want to have a testimonial, an accordion, or literally everything that's going to be on that page, we have to define schemas for them at the back end and set that up. And while I'm saying this, does this look like it has taken away the work from the developers yet? No? So in trying to use landing pages, it's still a lot of work for developers to go behind the scenes and set up all the schemas and get it ready, even the rendering logic that would at the end of the day display this, uh, this logic that we are setting up in the, in the schemas. It still falls on the developers to do that. And for the marketing team or for the content editors that we're trying to help, what we are really doing is giving them this huge, enormous form to fill, right? So if, for instance, someone is trying to post a blog post, we have all these entries like the title of your blog post, the slug, the content, the images that will go with it, the SEO metadata and all of that. So what we are really doing is just giving them a form to fill and taking away all their creative uh, freedom because for instance, if they wanted to add something else somewhere, or maybe they feel like, oh, as I'm filling this thing out, it might be nice to have a call to action button somewhere. They can't put that in. They just know they would like to have that, but they don't have any kind of flexibility to put that in there as they need it. So um, it was a good effort uh, bringing in headless CMSs, but the lesson that I think I took from that experience is that you, you can do visual design inside of a CMS. Right? You can compose your, your, stru your, con your, your structured content. You can do all the things that we've talked about. But if you really want to unblock non-developers who have no idea whatsoever how to write code or what to do when you, when you give them, um, uh, when they come to you with a task, what you do is not uh, give them a headless CMS uh, because you're taking away the creative flexibility from the non-developers uh, non and you're also putting a lot more work on the developers themselves trying to code up uh, the, sch the schemas and all that. And then uh, website builders emerged. Uh, and when I say website builders, I'm talking about the likes of Wix and Squarespace and the rest. They are really great, right? Uh, they give you the creative flexibility that we talked about. Uh, Non-developers can you know, move things around the screen. You know, literally, you have all the, the freedom to design a page or your site however you want it to look. So we applauded that. There's hundreds of templates. There's hundreds of themes. There's so many things to, to be happy about uh, when, when you're talking about visual building or how to let people who don't have technical experience uh, build and design pages themselves. But they might not satisfy uh, some more complex requirements. One of those is uh, if you're building a site, uh, for instance, like um, I did build a site once with Wix uh, when I, back in 2017, uh, when I was trying to get into having a website of my own. Uh, the thing that you can find with it is you don't get access to your code base. So if you wanted to, like, for instance, integrate that site that you've built on Wix or Squarespace or, where, or wherever else, uh, I'm, I'm only using those two for instances, uh, but all the website builders that, that are there today, if you're trying to integrate them back to your own tech stack, you find that it's not really going to help. That's, it's just not going to work. If you're, for instance, trying to do uh, like connect to an enterprise CMS somewhere where your data is coming from, that's very difficult to do. Uh, if you want to connect to your databases, there's a lot of uh, complex requirements that if you have as a company or just as an individual, you might not be able to pull that off uh, if, you're using, if you're relying on, on website builders. So 
Um, what about visual page builders? So these are tools that are created for this purpose, right? They are online visual editing platforms that allows you to, you know, you can design your site, you can build it, you can launch it, you can ship it to production without engineering oversight. So it's, uh, I think it's the latest advancement we've made in trying to get to the point where we allow non-developers to, to own their processes, right? And uh, full disclaimer, I work for this, um, this uh, visual page builder uh, that, that we call Plasmic. Um, I work as a director of developer experience, as I mentioned. And from here on out, what I want to do is kind of like share with you our own efforts and the advancements we've made in trying to get to the point where we are allowing uh, non-developers to just do their work by themselves. Uh, so just to show you what Plasmic looks like, if you haven't seen it before, it has this feel of Figma, if you know what Figma is, um, where you design your site and do the things that you want to do, and then hand it off to, to, to developers to build out the project. But in Plasmic, you design the site, you have the creative flexibility to design it, and then it also has the capacity to interact, to put your code in there, to basically, as you're designing the site, you can click a button to, to publish the site. So all the things that you've designed, see it as though you're, you're in Figma and you're designing something, but when you're done designing, you can just publish it and it becomes code, right? So a lot of things, uh, go on behind the scenes, of course, that I'll talk about. But that's how we are trying to, that's how we are approaching solving the problem of allowing non-developers to be able to, you know, own their processes. Uh, so, one of the favorite things uh, I like about Plasmic, the things that I care about the most, is that you can integrate it with any tech stack. So, unlike some of the things that I've talked about in the past, is this not working? Okay, there you go. Yeah, um, so unlike some of the things that I've talked about, um, if you're using Plasmic, you can be sure that regardless of um, the tech stack that you already own or where your company is already, uh, the, the, the stack, the entire tech stack of your company, you can integrate it back with, uh, with Plasmic. So um, if you wanted, you can build your site in Vue.js, React.js, AngularJS, PHP really, well, it, the choice is yours, basically. So we just allow you to do these designs, and then you can deploy it and publish it in whatever could be that you find more interesting. Uh, something else that we do is we give you this creative flexibility that I talked about. It's just a visual page builder that you can design how you want. You can move things around. You can pixel push as much as you want. You're just like the designer of the site, so you can put things wherever you want them to be. And then you can deploy without oversight. So we made it so that if you're building with Plasmic, it's very easy for you to deploy to GitHub or to any other uh, hosting provider of your choice. That way, um, non-developers who just know how to follow uh, prompts on screen can build their sites and deploy without any kind of engineering oversight. So you can bring in your custom design systems, for instance, uh, which is something that is also very important to people, is if, if I'm trying to build something or if I'm handing off the job to a marketing team to build, and I want them to stick to the, um, to the design systems that we have as a company, to our own brand identity, how do they do that then? Because what some of uh, these other providers do for you is that they give you templates you can use, or they just allow you to code the whole thing up by yourself. Uh, but Plasmic allows you to bring in your design systems so that whatever you're doing on the, on the platform is in sync with what you currently have uh, back home. And then you can bring your production data from anywhere. Um, so at the moment, you can already bring data in from, from Superbase database, uh, from Sanity IO, Strapi, headless CMSs of your choice. Plasmic also does have uh, an inbuilt uh, Plasmic CMS that integrates with the studio as well. So if your data is hosted there for any reason, it's, uh, you can easily integrate that into your design. And lastly, you can do custom animations and effects. Um, so it, there's usually the restriction of doing complex things, quote unquote, in a visual page builder. Uh, but if you're really concerned about styling and animations and how your design works, this uh, Plasmix allows you to also do all of these things out of the box. OK, um, this is uh, my favorite slide. The, 
the thing that I talk about the most when I talk about Plasmic is the Figma importer, uh, because that is the one that gave me the wow moment, right? When I started using Plasmic, is I could go to uh, any Figma design. When I uh, copy it, Plasmic has this uh, plugin, uh, a Figma plugin that you can use to export that design, regardless of the, the length of the design or how big it is or how many files it is. You can export that design and just do a copy. And then back in Plasmic, if you open a blank canvas and do a Command V, you can paste that entire design file and it will show up completely coded in accordance with your design specifications, including your Figma components. So the, the time that it would take me, for instance, to make uh, a design file into a published website, if I'm using Plasmic, is probably less than one minute, right? And there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, of course, to make that possible. But then you still have the creative flexibility to walk around all those things however you want it to be. Uh, the thing that I also like is that before I started working at Plasmic, I worked at Netlify as a senior developer experience engineer. So I'm very big on rendering patterns and rendering modes. So if I'm building a site, I want to be sure that I can do static rendering, I can do server-side rendering. I want the site to be fast, I want it to be optimized. That is something that uh, I was very happy to find out, that even at the time I was joining Plasmic, these things were already done. And if you wanted to have that, uh, like you want to have access to rendering different parts of your sites with the, re with the rendering modes that you care about, you can do static rendering, you can do server-side rendering. It's all given to you out of the box. And then we have uh, image optimizations. So one of the things that, well, one of the biggest things that make websites slow today is how they process image assets, right? Um, Plasmic has a functionality in place to make sure that every asset that exists, that exists in your project is optimized by default. And then um, we have props and overrides. So something that is very big as well, I think one of our biggest features is the fact that we have this thing called code components, right? So if you're, um, if you're building a site in Plasmic and you wanted to bring in some part of your code that kind of like already exists somewhere, say for instance you, you've built up this button component that you want to use across your projects, and you're building this project inside of Plasmic. You can, you can register that button component inside of Plasmic, and then when you put a button on screen in Plasmic, it will be the exact same button that is coming from your code, the one that you already have the source files for and everything. So uh, if you're using code components, it means you can pass props and override our own existing APIs to put in your data. The flexibility is unmatched. Uh, which is something I'm also very excited about and why this is my favorite slide as well. Um, personalization is something that uh, we care about lately. Uh, if you've been keeping an eye out uh, in the front end community, uh, engineering generally, we are trying to make sure that if we're building products, we are tailoring the experiences to better suit the end users of that product, right? If I'm building a site for InfoBib Shift, for instance, and I know that uh, a lot of Croatians are going to go to that site. I want to personalize it so that if you're reading it, you can select the languages that you want to read it in. If you're using an Android phone, I want to know that you're using an Android phone, and then I could personalize the experience for you. So instead of telling you to, for instance, uh, you know, download this thing on Apple Store, I would know that you're using an Android phone, and then I could direct you to Google Store instead. So personalization is something that people really care about lately, and I'm just happy to for the fact that Plasmic also supports that uh, out of the box. A-B testing is possible. I think I'm running short on time. Uh, dynamic pages and dynamic routes. Something that uh, I care about as a person is when I'm trying to build a site, I want to make sure that the experience is intuitive, like the same experience you would get from the site that you're already used to. If I'm directing you to my site for the first time, I want to do everything that I can to make sure that as you're coming to that site, you are also having a similar experience, something that will not uh, break your mental flow as you're using it. So uh, A-B testing, dynamic pages and routes also allows you to do that. And the last thing that gives me really good uh, energy when I'm talking about Plasmic is the zero locking. Uh, uh, you have complete freedom with your complete ownership of your project and your code, right? You can use Plasmic to do something, but at the end of the day, you don't have to keep that in in Plasmic. 
you can design your, your blog site, your personal site, or whatever functionality you want to design. And at the end of the day, push it to GitHub, deploy it wherever you want. We don't really care so much about where your data is coming from, where your data is, where the site is hosted. It's all up to you. What we are trying to do is just make it easy for people to design the experiences they want without relying on developers, put, uh, publish it to production, launch it, and have people use it. That way, we, would, uh, we wouldn't have to deal with the continuous reliance on engineering teams. So uh, in summary, what we are doing as a community is we are collectively making strides to empower more people to be able to do things by themselves without the constant reliance on engineering teams who are, by, by the way, always strapped uh, for resources. I've never gone to a company and seen an, engineer, an engineering team that just has time to do whatever you throw at them. There's usually so much at stake and so much on the table for them to do that. And then, uh, all software products has trade-offs. So if I were to give you one advice today, I would say focus on the things that solve your problem. And that way, we can all uh, go home being very happy because our problems have been solved. Thank you very much once again. My name is Kenny, and I'm happy to meet you all.